planet Earth. A world of mystery and imagination, science and wonder that is constantly being gazed upon and unraveled by the finest minds humanity has to offer. Welcome to the UniV podcast, the show that presents a free-flowing conversation with those beings at the very center of the world of academia and research from all around the globe with your host, Simon Holland. Hello and welcome to episode seven of the UniV podcast. Today we talk to Rodney J. Paul, who is a sports economist and currently professor of sports management in the David B. Falk College of Sport and Human Dynamics at Syracuse University. He has published extensively in academic journals on the economics and finance of sport, involving detailed analysis of data in sports such as the NFL and NBA and seeks answers to unusual hypotheses such as the effects of fighting on attendance at ice hockey. Rodney recently designed the Bachelor of Science degree in Sport Analysis that is applying analytic principles and metrics to sports data. Similar to the Sabre metrics made popular by the Hollywood film Moneyball, this degree would be the first of its kind in the US. Without further ado, we welcome Professor Rodney Paul to the show. My name is uh, Rodney Paul, and I am a professor of sport management at uh, Syracuse University in the uh, Falk College of Sport and Human Dynamics. Sport economics. So what's the classical definition of the field, and can you kind of break it down for us? Sure. Now, the uh, sports economics, I think, is rather recent in terms of looking back in, in time, in terms of being um, recognized as kind of a sub-discipline within economics, really kind of uh, hit the wave at the right time of people getting interested in it. So I think uh, even within the last, you know, 15 years or 20 years, it's been uh, really something that's come about. But long before that, people have used data in sports to be able to test general economic principles because the data for sports generally was available. And people found ways to be able to test things, particularly about labor markets that you might not have been able to test otherwise. And I think the field kind of stemmed out of that. And, you know, more and more people got interested in being able to test different things related to economics using sports data. And then I think that revolution kind of came that, well, we kind of care about sports for sports sake as well. So can also go ahead and go beyond just being able to use, you know, sports as an excuse to be able to get data to test economic principles to try to be able to really apply economics to sports to be able to better understand and better be able to explain and even approach, you know, sports in terms of uh, that angle. And I think I've been very lucky and uh, it's been great to be a part of kind of this rise that's happened. It was uh, something that very few people were involved in when I think I first started. And uh, there's a uh, you know, a few, that's a matter of like, you know, conference just went to or going to, you know, a few hundred people get together and be able to, uh, you know, present and be able to talk about different issues in uh, sports economics. So it's a very uh, interesting time to be a part of it. So we we can talk about, I guess, the elephant in the room, and that's the movie Moneyball. Is that what you attribute the rise of it or is there something different? Was it a cultural kind of turning point? <laughs> Yeah, I think that in terms of the analytics side, if you want to go ahead and break it down that way, I believe Moneyball obviously was something that, that um, turned the tide in terms of being able to have more people recognize the, the value of being able to crunch the numbers and be able to make things work on the uh, analytical side to be able to apply to sports. But it really kind of goes back, I think, beyond that in terms of uh, Bill James for, for baseball. Um, that was kind of the first foray, I think, that I really kind of saw when I was young, that his books were so totally different than anything else that were out there in terms of his abstracts and for other sports it kind of arose in the same type of way many much later but people started to be able to delve into the numbers and start to tell different stories and find ways to be able to really classify which players are better or what players might fit better in different markets and things like that but I think kind of Moneyball was the culmination of that in terms of you know being able to how well the book was written and you know the movie as well to be able to have more and more people come to the general acceptance of that I think uh, led to more of a mass market type appeal to that but I think it have been growing for for quite a long time and I think that the economic side of it fits in as well because obviously you're trying to be able to you know sign good players for as low of money value as possible. So in terms of thinking about the player side of the labor market, that fit the economics of labor you know very 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 well. And um, I think they kind of coincided in terms of that particular rise. But the the sports economic side deals with so many different issues, whether it's kind of like government side in terms of its role in sports and different policy issues and things like that, to kind of more direct overlap with the analytics as to what, what players are really worth and how they're valued and what type of uh, you know, things really contribute to team wins and can you do anything to be able to influence that, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's like multi facets that were occurring at the same time and now it's kind of all lumped together. So what came first? Were you a sports fan? You must have been a sports fan growing up, I imagine, and then discovered economics and fell in love with that or what came first for you? 
Yeah, no, I mean, I've always, uh, I played, you know, sports in terms of growing up and loved it and have always watched. And I was a big statistical simulation fan. We have a series of board games uh, that I played as a youngster that was uh, things like APBA and Stratomatic that were all stat-based games. And I would just spend countless hours being able to play those games and delve into the statistics of players. And I laughed back to myself that I also kind of developed a little crude model of uh, attendance at the at the time when I'd be playing the games to think of oh, okay, well, here's the weather conditions and here's how many people are likely to be at the stadium that game. So I think that had that going at maybe, you know, eight or nine years old that I uh, had no idea would be something that we'd be doing in the future. But I always had that, you know, interest on, on that side as well. So I love the statistical stuff. And then as the computers and things arose, there was, you know, more intricate simulations to be able to be done with those type of things. And that was all for fun. Uh, but it turned out that there was a lot of interesting questions to be asked, uh, answered, I think, on, on those ends. And it kind of arose from there. So so undergraduate, I was I started mathematics and I didn't know exactly what to do with it. And then I found economics and I enjoyed that. So I double majored and I wound up going to grad school at uh, Clemson University for for economics. And they had a lot, it's a really an applied and economics uh, type degree. And they had a lot of people that were doing you know sports economics and very interested in sports. And again, kind of very much you know luck on on my part that I hit kind of a group that really kind of accepted that and believed that it was something that was an interesting thing to be able to research and was able to feed off of that and start to be able to do some of the stuff on my own, um, you know, as I was uh, you know, after, after graduation. So, um, and then it just kind of took off from there that there was enough interest in being able to do the research that I've uh, turned into a career. So from an economics point of view, I guess sports is the dream because there's such a rich documented history um, and huge data sets, very specific data sets. That must be really important for you guys. Yes, it is. I mean, it's a matter of, I think the, the data, you know, drove the interest to begin with, just because there was even, you know, I do a lot of work on like uh, efficient markets and behavioral biases and how that relates to betting markets. And you think back to how difficult it was to get financial data, you know, going back in time, or if it wasn't difficult, it was very, very expensive. And I think a lot of the studies of market efficiency arose in betting markets because the data was just there. And, you know, because the data was there, it was a very nice little controlled experiment to be able to look at and be able to test some principles that you otherwise would not be able to test. And then as people looked more and more into the sports and saw how much people keep track of everything that happens, well, you know, more and more different economic principles are able to be tested because people see, you know, within the labor market, I always joke with my students that if you kept track of every single word that I spoke and basically every example that I used, et cetera, and graded me and scored me on that, it would be a very, very different world. And sports, you know, athletes are basically subjected to that because they're kept, so many different things are kept track of them for every single appearance. And now with technology, they're keeping track of things at practice and, you know, in terms of training and all that kind of stuff that the data out there is just is just amazing and I really think that uh, we we even might be at another you know revolution in terms of the more data that comes out there now as the technology continues to improve there's many many more things to be tested and, and some of it will just be for fun because it'll be nice uh, data to be able to get a hands on but some might be actually really insightful to uh, to a lot of different things whether it's things like injuries and concussions that might go ahead and have a good bearing down the line that the technology and statistics might help us with just to, again, the money ball type principle of knowing more and more about player performance and what really drives it. Is there a trick to mining this information set? It depends. I mean, it's a matter of that. Some data is just clean and easy for you to be able to get at because the people that do this, they might not even be associated with the leagues, but they love it so much that they put it out there for people to be able to use. And that's just immensely valuable. Otherwise, it just depends on what you're trying to be able to get at. Um, I'm not great in terms of the computer side. I mean, it's something that I'm it's passable, I think, but I don't really consider myself to be, be great at that. And a lot of the data that I had you know, gathered going back a decade or so was kind of teaching. You know, just basically I would find something and have to enter it and check it and be able to work from there. But in terms of the scraping technology and lots of things that are out there now, it's becoming easier and easier. So students that I'm working with today are being able to go out and grab data sets in a couple hours that would have taken me months, you know, to be able to uh, to put together just as recently as maybe five years ago. So um, I think that there's, uh, there's great sources out there. And part of what uh, we're aiming to do in terms of the program is to challenge 
challenge the students to go out there and even find you know better data and, and different data and be able to find different ways to collect it so that more things can be tested and more insights can be gained. Now, you've just launched a brand new course at Syracuse. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, it's, um, in terms of our new major, it's a sports analytics major, and the major itself is going to focus on a few different things. It's focusing on sports economics. It's focusing on mathematics and statistics. It's focusing on computers and information technology as kind of the, the core, and then we want to be able to build communication skills, and we also have a foreign language requirement so that uh, we can go ahead and be able to send people out to different areas of the world to be able to work on these things. And the main thing that we're doing in-house that kind of I'm teaching, the people that will be working with me will be teaching, is a two-part sequence, what we call sports data analysis, which in a lot of ways is an applied econometrics course. It, it invokes some other elements of different statistical methods and different things that are out there as well, but mainly it's an applied econometrics course using all kinds of sports data from across the spectrum, whether that has to do with players, whether it has to do with teams, or if it has to do with the business side. And so we're kind of being able to bring all those things together, make that work. There's also a two-part sequence in the business side of this, which would be a sports economics course that has to do with applying traditional economic principles to things that people have done in the past for sports, to looking at you know newer things like the you know, dynamic pricing models and things like that of tickets that are out there. So those sequences, in addition to you know, research methods, and we're capping it off with a full year uh, thesis that the students would be doing that are you know, it's modeled after an honors thesis, and they'd be able to do a deep dive into um, any subject matter that relates analytically to sports. And I think there's going to be more jobs, obviously, out there on the business side than there's going to be on the player analysis side, but we're not going to discourage the students from doing what they want. We want them to be able to follow their dreams, but be able to give them full information as to where we think the jobs are and what we'd like to recommend. And uh, I think there's, there's a lot of really, really interesting possibilities that, that are out there, but it's been a lot of fun putting together the kind of core courses because it's been grabbing different type of data to be able to illustrate, you know, common statistical problems or econometric problems using sports data in different settings. And that way, students get exposed to a lot of different um, elements of sports, but they also can learn where the problems lie and how to deal with different statistical and econometric problems they might see through an example that they're probably familiar with and excited about. So as opposed to giving sports examples to someone that's not interested in sports or using non-sports examples to uh, get to people who want to do sports as a career, I think it's kind of hitting that sweet spot of being able to have people that are interested in sports and then making all of the examples be about sports. I found, I played sports as well growing up and I find that if you run, when you run into people in the world that play sports, they tend to think differently. They're very efficient and, and good at aiming for a common goal and, and analyzing strengths and weaknesses of other team members and sort of trying to bring out the best in them. Is that something that you find with your students or people coming through in general? Yes, I mean, more and more that I think about this when I talk about it, it, it's in some ways I'm being a coach as opposed to being an instructor or a teacher. It's that uh, being able to try to find, you know, their comparative advantages, for lack of a better term economics-wise, but be able to find what they're best at and be able to kind of get them on the path to be able to uh, to use that to the fullest abilities and be able to find ways to inspire them to be able to uh, overcome their weaknesses and uh, so kind of be able to uh, you know, build those type of things up. And so that's a, that's a real exciting part of this, but I, I definitely agree with you. People that you know follow sports, that played sports and things, there's a really team element there that might be lost on people that do not get to do it. I mean, it's something I talk about in class when we look back in time and say, you know, female participation in sports growing. You go back in time where they didn't have that type of um, outlet to be able to be out there with teamwork and being able to develop leadership skills and things like that. But, you know, there's, there's some link there probably to, you know, the CEO type jobs and things like that. They, that, you know, the sports kind of, I think, builds up a, a skill set that you might not be able to get elsewhere in terms of being able to overcome adversity or be able to, you know, work within a team framework, et cetera, that I think, you know, sports, you know, working toward a common goal is something that really is great for, for children to be able to experience and people to be able to experience throughout their lives because it brings something a little bit different to them, that kind of uh, maybe a little bit different drive than you might be able to get otherwise. Not that you couldn't. I mean, there's obviously a lot of other outlets that are competitive 
competitive and that people need to work together, etc. But I'm kind of biased because I just love sports and I, I think I see it kind of like you just mentioned. But um, yeah, I think the positive attributes to sports are just terrific. So many times in society, we focus on the negatives that, that happen in sports, but it, it's nice to be able to step back and be able to appreciate the positive. You talked a little bit about sports booming and definitely from um, the, the, when I heard about this course, it just made complete sense because the business side is so intrinsically like sports and money and money and sports are so linked together that if people want to try and earn a living working in sports with sports, that this is such a great way to do this. And so sports, I think as an industry, uh, opposed to business, which, you know, finance up and down and all the rest of it, but sports seems like a particularly resilient and lucrative market because when things are going well, people turn to sports as an indulgence. And when times are tough, people kind of turn to sports for hope. So, you know, if your team's terrible, you can sort of generally change sports unless maybe you're Cleveland. But I mean, even they've got basketball now. But um, do you think sports is an industry that might be resistant to downturn that just kind of looks like it's projected to go up? Yeah, especially in the way that they, they kind of model the revenue coming in, because that you think about it, well, a downturn in the economy might impact your attendance. And so maybe not as many people are able to go to the games, but it leads to an increase in television viewership. And so there's so much money out there on the television side, because in a lot of ways, it's the last bastion of live you know, TV, of watching something when, it, when it's broadcast, because people want to see it as it happens. And I think that fits so much into what happens with fantasy sports and with um, you know sports betting and other things as well. Well, that you know, obviously can have negative connotations uh, in addition to you know, just the people uh, having their interests. But I think people want to watch it live because they like to watch how the game unfolds. They like to watch their favorite players. They might be cheering for their own fantasy team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it, it really goes ahead and brings in a captive audience that we see in terms of the size of the television deals that are out there for the major sport. And so I think that is a really unique um, type market that's kind of resistant a bit to the uh, you know, um, taping of things, DVR etc cetera, etc cetera, that would be out there being able to watch things streaming later that people want to watch it at that point in time and the networks realize that and that's where the big money is coming in on that front and i think that the market for ticket pricing has evolved so much as well that things like being able to change prices in real time as to dynamic pricing allows for you to be able to understand what that when the economy softens and people don't have as much money it's not as bad for you to be able to lower the prices to some games as it might have been in the past in terms of signals and other things things like that, that you know, now you can still go ahead and bring people in, even though it might be you know a few dollars less than it was in terms of uh, previously. You're not sticking with that solid one price that you used to have in the past that you weren't willing to go below. Now there gets to be flexibility. And people you know, oftentimes on the pricing side focus on well how high the ticket prices go, but there's also a lot of examples out there that markets have been able to do much better by being able to lower price and increase quantity enough that it offsets that. So I think the price flexibility that's been built into the attendance side and how important the television revenue has gotten to be is uh, is exactly why and you know, what you just mentioned in terms of in a lot of ways it's kind of outside the realm of the normal economy it kind of works well in, in any type of setting now i noticed you did a lot of work on ticket sales you've you've published a few papers and that sort of thing what are some of the main factors uh, that you found that influenced ticket sales? Yeah, I really focus on a, a few different things. You know, from the economic side, we're interested in competitive balance and uncertainty of outcome. So basically, how you know how much does it matter if the teams are relatively you know evenly matched? Uh, how much does it matter if one team is dominant? You know, take a Golden State uh, regular season for for this year in the NBA, could that have a negative effect because the team is so good that other fans in other cities might not have uh, you know uh, held out hope other than you know, Oklahoma City or something like that? But it's a matter of that. Um, you know, those things. I think are, are very, very interesting. So trying to be able to figure out that type of relationship that's out there and, and what matters for that. Um, I've been very interested in the element of scoring as opposed to a defensive type game and found a lot of evidence that fans prefer scoring to lack of scoring. Well, that's pretty much across sports um, and the different things that I've looked at. That once you account for the quality of the team, the quality of the team that you're playing, another thing that gets to be important is the uh, kind of excitement that's involved in the game. And we kind of proxy that by scoring to be able to to look at things there, plus just the auxiliary things that come into play. I'm a, I'm a big um, ice hockey fan myself, and the role of fighting is so unique <laughs> in hockey, and being able to look at some studies that fans seem to respond positively, that teams that fight more do go ahead and attract more fans, <laughs> and that would you know, lead to why the policy wouldn't necessarily change, as many people would think, in the sense of saying, oh, why don't you just get rid of fighting? Well, it's not just that they, you know, players might think it's important to be able to protect their own, but it also seems to be something that uh, the fans 
enjoy, but if you took it away, you might be having some revenue risk on that side. So, yeah, so yeah, so I think a lot of it has to do with that. Other things I've looked at is weather, you know, for outdoor uh, sporting events and you know, how that impacts uh, things in terms of what kind of gets to be the optimal um, uh, temperature or you know humidity even for uh, for different sports in different cities. And that, that's been a lot of fun too because uh, it's something that with the immense amount of weather data out there, you can link it up to the immense amount of sports data, and now yeah. there's a lot of fun things you can do with it. I was going to say, I see, I live in Australia, so we've got pretty good weather most of the time. But when you see those Minnesota Vikings games in the snow and the ice <laughs> in Green Bay, I just it's unbelievable that there's people there. It's <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, some cities I think they they thrive on that for a sport like football, but it, it gets to be part of the, the culture to be out there and be tough and be uh, be out there and brave the elements to be able to support your team. But you get the same type of weather for a baseball game, and the fans aren't going to be as willing to be out there and brave the elements. So there's a interesting psychological uh, component that's going at play there um, as well. That would be fun to disentangle. Now, to deviate just for a little second, I'm a uh, Miami Heat fan. Well, I'm actually a Seattle Supersonics fan, but they took my team away. I had to go for a, oh, B, uh, okay. I had to go for a B team, and they were pretty good back in the day. And, and I realized yeah. why I like them is because they always got good players sort of in the second, third of their career. Like Tim Hardaway went there, Alonzo Mourning went there. And a lot of players like that, if you look at the team now, it's stacked with like Amari Stoudemire's and these kind of like, not quite twilight, but definitely on the sort of senior end of the stick. I kind of just dawned on me while I was watching um, the game the other day. It's because of the weather. They go there because it's like a nice, it's Miami. It's like beaches and stuff. Do you, is that is that part of it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the NBA, it might be more so than others because the NBA has the individual cap on player salaries, not just in terms of the team-wise, which is a soft cap, but they also have a, a max in terms of the players. And for some of these guys in Twilight, they might not be up against that cap. But, um, you know, so in some ways, the players can self-select, I think, in that particular market, particularly when you're at the elite end. You might go ahead and be able to choose to go some place nice or choose to play with your friends, right? To be able to say, oh, if I could bring in these two other guys that I used to play with or would love to play with and try to win a championship, I think that becomes um, you know, definitely something that kind of tilts the competitive balance a little bit because the uh, the players can kind of dictate that, whereas in a more of an open market, they might just get off to another X number of million dollars that would be able to uh, to lure them someplace else. But but I think, yeah, definitely there, there's some evidence out there that players are willing to be able to give up some additional dollars to be able to play in places that they like. And that, that could be weather, as you mentioned. It could just be a history of success. It could be you know, where their friends are. I think there's a lot of interesting elements that are out there. And uh, and that's something I think that would be fun to be able to look at. People have begun to, to look at those type of things in the labor market. But it also might relate more to the uh, deep analytics that are out there to be able to figure out, well, what attributes of a player leads to this? You know, is there something out there that uh, gets to be the players, you know, more prone to injury? And so being able to be in a you know, climate that might not be as cold you know, might go ahead and be able to lengthen their career. Who knows? I think there's a lot of uh, fun type of things to be able to study out there and related to that topic. Now, there's two teams in the NFL. Um, I guess you could call them small market teams. There's a lot of talk about small market and big market, like we were talking about. But the right. San Diego Chargers could be moving to LA, and the St. Louis Rams already went went there. So. What could a move from a small market to a large market potentially do for those teams? Yeah, no, it definitely goes ahead and opens up a lot more uh, revenue than they did they be able to get otherwise. And the revenue itself, even though the NFL has a pretty hard cap in terms of what you can spend, it does allow you to be able to front end contracts. So you can go ahead and be able to give out bigger signing bonuses to be able to attract a higher quality of players. So I think a lot of the smaller markets in the NFL might suffer from the, the idea that they can't quite attract the free agents because they might not be able to offer as much money up front. So it's just a present value problem in terms of looking at how those things go. There's other problems. Again, we're close to Buffalo, where I'm at in, in Syracuse, and it could just be the climate there, going back to your that previous uh, comment that you know people might not want to go there as much because of the climate. But, um, but yes, I think as you get to a, a bigger market, there's so many more things that you can attract money-wise you know, from the, from the attendance, the stadium, that the city might be able to go ahead and put out there for you to just other revenue sources that you would not be able to get in a, in a smaller market. So I think those things are, you know, teams are always looking for that. And and sometimes they're just looking to not necessarily even move up in market, a lateral move, just to be able to have another city that's willing to build up a stadium, right? be able to not have the uh, money fall upon the uh, team ownership, to be able to cough up for a really nice, pretty new stadium, but have the uh, taxpayers be able to pay for that. So that's part of the logic of having you know fewer teams out 
out there than the number of cities that demand one. That creates a lot of market power. When we're talking about superstars attracting people to their team, do, do you think some teams still suffer from superstar attraction, like a, a big name or a high draft pick? Or is there something more that having a big name like that brings to a team? I really think it might depend upon the sport. And I think that in some ways, the, the idea gets to be that teams can be very interesting over a long haul. Maybe baseball, it does not matter as much, you know, because you can go ahead and get a, really attached to a team over a 162 game schedule. So you can go ahead and be able to have a, a bunch of pretty good players, you know, or you know, very, very good players, but not superstar elite players that go ahead and be able to, um, you know, the fans follow and be able to get that without having necessarily the true, you know, superstar be able to drive it. Whereas maybe something like basketball with fewer players on the court and a, you know, half the length of the season on most of what's in Major League Baseball, it might be much more dependent upon star power. And we do see from a variety of economic studies that star power in the NBA is something that really drives the interest of fans, not just at home, but on the road, right? So they go ahead and they go somewhere else to play and they, they, the attendance just jumps up dramatically because they want to go ahead and be able to see that uh, that star player. So uh, I think there's some of that in other sports as well in terms of things like hockey. I know here um, probably uh, some of that in terms of MLS in the U.S. and the, again, not as familiar uh, with a lot of the other attendance studies around the world, but given that they can go ahead and attract a few of the players that might be you know, kind of what you mentioned before, some of these players in the twilights of their career or even a little bit later that have been stars overseas that come over here. I think fans like to see them as they as they tour the country uh, in that particular sport. And uh, the NFL, I think, is so popular that it's sometimes hard to be able to separate out whether it gets to be the star player or it just gets to be the, the team. You know, So I think that um, there's a lot of interesting angles to be able to come in there and be able to look at. But, but to me, basketball is the one that just jumps out immediately at that. That if you have a star player, not only can you go ahead and be able to reap the benefits of that and revenue-wise from attendance and other types of things that you're going to be able to get you know, television deals, but also it gives you a, a greater chance to win because you know, the amount of uh, time and the number of times that player can have the ball and make an impact on the game is much different than what it would be in other sports. And has the detailed analysis of the metrics of, of players changed the way that we evaluate talent now? Because you read in magazines that they're looking at junior college players and, you know, like, high elementary kids even you know oh this kid's six foot four there's there's this likelihood that he'll get to this whatever whatever are we looking too deep do you think in these numbers or is there sort of a room for a gut feeling as well if, if an old older kind of scout can look at him and go a nice jump shot whatever yeah I'm a, I'm a big believer that, that you need both and I don't think that the stats uh, go out there and replace in the human eye in terms of scouting I think there's such unique skills that go into scouts that some of that is difficult to quantify and I also though believe believe that if you can quantify it, you might be able to go ahead and fine-tune those type of things. So I think there's this kind of synergy that's out there that may be occurring in some places, may not be occurring in others, where what's happening is that the when the scouts buy in and they can verbalize and say, oh, I, you know, I see these two players and they look almost exactly the same, but if I could just get X to be able to figure out the difference, well, maybe we can quantify X and that would go ahead and be able to help them. But I think that, as you mentioned, it's definitely changed. It's allowed for a lot of different things to be able a little come into play that have not seen before and people are trying to find ways to project even from you know very young ages as to how that will project to a college game or professional game etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think that uh, people are doing good work on that how much of that actually gets to be used or how much of that gets to be useful is, is anybody anybody's guess but the process is something you have to go through to get to something that works as well so so yes I agree in some ways that we might be overdoing it that everything gets to be looked at in at the end agree but in some ways I think I prefer to have more information than less. Now just to talk about a sort of a I guess more of a local problem I don't know really what what the scenario is in, in America but in Australia sports gambling is just really taking off as an industry probably the last four or five years if you watch like an Australian rules football game now which is arguably our biggest sport well it is our biggest sport every second or third ads is is gambling and it's an it's a new com- new companies that you haven't heard and new ways of doing it on your phone and new packages like a hundred dollars of online cash when you do that is 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 gambling sports gambling kind of a sucker's game in 2016 because these guys must have massive data sets themselves and their own economists figuring out the best packages and the slimmest margins and yeah, is it a sucker's game or is this something that punters can really get involved in and 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 be mm. successful? 
I mean, I think that, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, it's obviously very, very difficult to beat, right? So it's a matter of that the people that are putting together the odds, um, et cetera, they, they know what they're doing, right? So it's a matter of that they have great models, they have great insights into what's happening. And the, the market efficiency studies that I've done, when you go ahead and be able to look at how accurate the, the outcomes are, you know, looking at the, the actual game outcome versus the prediction from the, the odds or the different prices that are out there in the betting market, it's just amazing, you know? that they do in the overall, you know, sample. So you get a large enough sample, and this thing looks to be just you know, almost perfect. But obviously what's interesting is from game to game, you get a lot of noise, and you wind up having a lot of different, uh, you know, big outcomes. So, so a team that's a big underdog can go ahead and be able to pull off a stunt of victory. And I think that's what makes the club sport so much, that the uncertainty is that if we knew what was going to happen, it might not be as compelling. But to me, I think a lot of people that continue to gamble, and this is separate from the problem gambling, right? So if we're going to have to go off into the addiction end and people, you know, going ahead and suffering from those set of things, it's different than what I'm talking about here. But for people that might not suffer from that, I, I think it's much more of a form of consumption entertainment. That what happens is that people latch on to this and they're willing, even though they might not go ahead and admit it to themselves, you know, outright, they're willing to lose something to be able to go out there and have more of an attachment to the game or to the team. So the game kind of means more to them or it's more fun to watch when they actually have something riding on it. And we realized that that can lead, lead to problems. A lot of my research is kind of bringing out that sports betting is consumption. That if you follow the trends and you follow what people are doing, they really seem to behave just like fans do. So they like the same things that if we just were to look at fan behavior and say, what do they like about a game? And we look at gamblers' behavior, what do they like about a game based upon what they're betting? Those two things are almost perfect overlap. So it's not like there's a big portion of the market that's out there that's doing the research and behaving as an investor and really not caring about watching the game. I think most of the people that are involved in the market are sports fans, and it's just that the involvement, whether it's directly from betting or whether it's more of a kind of auxiliary type thing like fantasy sports that go ahead and is in some ways you know, betting, but in other ways just being able to put together and follow your favorite players. I think those things make it more interesting for people to watch. And if that, those options weren't out there, we might not see as much interest in, in sports because I think that really kind of builds an attachment. And uh, obviously, as I mentioned a couple of times here, it can lead to problems. But um, if you compare it to being able to go out to the movies, right? You're taking a risk in going out to the movies of whether it's going to be interesting and a good time or not. So you might lose the same amount of money gambling on a you know, Saturday afternoon or something watching a match, uh, but you're going to get the enjoyment out of that just like you would in being able to go to the movies or going out to dinner or something like that. So I think that uh, if we view it as consumption and saying that, okay, they're willing to pay a bit for the chance of enjoying the game more and be able to possibly be up at the end of the day, you know, being able to win some money, I think that makes a lot more sense than just trying to say these are pure investors out there trying to be able to make that, uh, you know, make money off of this like a, a Wall Street person or something. But there, there are some that are out there trying to do it, but from most of the research that I've seen, the research that I've done, it, it looks very difficult to be able to do that. Any margins that are out there are very, very, very small. The other side of the coin, I think that's why they lost me as a sports gambler, is that my team stunk and betting against them, I sort of was stuck with the like head in the heart scenario there. Exactly. Yes, it, it's tough because, you know, it's, if you think about uh, you know, finance and you think about what would be the optimal play, given that you enjoy watching your team, well, the, the play there would be to bet against your team every time because then either way you're going to be happy, right? You're balancing out your portfolio. <laughs> but I don't think anybody behaves that way, right? I, I don't think there's any kind of behavioral thing out there saying that, oh, I'm going to cheer for my team, but if they lose, I'm going to win, uh, win money. I think that uh, if they're going to bet, they're going to bet on their own teams. And if you take a case like Pete Rose, you know, classic gambling scandal in terms of baseball in the U.S. And it wasn't that he was betting against his team. He was betting on it. Right? Was that he had so much confidence in, in that his team was going to win and in himself that he was willing to be able to put money out there uh, on himself. And we see that in sports like horse racing where obviously certain people involved in the horses are allowed to bet on those horses. But it's uh, it's interesting. I think a lot of you know, fans behave the same way. But I, I can't tell you that I've never come across a person that uh, undertook the scenario you just said where they're, they're out there perfectly willing to bet against their own team <laughs> to be able to try to hedge their bets. So they always seem to be betting on their, their favorite team. You should see, because we're, we're cricket fans in, here in Australia, and um, that's a global sport, but 
lots of weird countries are involved in it. And you should see the antics right. that go on in like Pakistan or Indian, like the corruption scandals and the throwing yeah. games to win. You know, it's just insane corruption in some of those countries. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's a difficult thing. And it's something that uh, it, it's tough for, you know, um, a lot of places to be able to monitor and be able to keep, uh, keep a watchful eye out. I mean, I think the, I'm a little bit more familiar with the soccer scandals that have occurred. And so many of them happened a little bit of the lower divisions because you can actually go ahead and be able to uh, bribe someone to be able to throw a game at that particular level because there's you know not as much money being able to be thrown around as that, that would be out there for the players. So I think it was really interesting that, wow, that A, to me, that there was a big enough market to be able to uh, have someone throw a notch. But then you know, when I thought about it, I think it, it makes some more sense. And it, it's, it's difficult because if people lose faith in the gambling markets, ultimately they might not just turn away from gambling, they might turn away from sports. So it's kind of this kind of weird little balance that's going on there that at least in the U.S. it's kind of sports leagues are at least saying they're kind of against the gambling but in a lot of ways I think they realize that it helps them it helps them go ahead and be able to attract and keep an audience so it's this love-hate relationship that they have with it. Okay so if we're looking at say politics corporations these days have gotten so big that they can influence politics quite easily Um, you get some you know uh, senators or whatever they're voting some really weird trying to bring in some weird bills and then you sort of find out down the track, oh, that's probably why. Do you think the the gambling industry could ever get so big? Because it does seem to be a very, I guess, addictive but engaging model. Do you think that it could ever get so big, so profitable that it will start to affect the sporting organizations themselves, like, you know, the NCAA or the NHL, the, you know, that kind of thing, it'll, it could outgrow them? Possibly, yeah. It's never really occurred to me that it would occur as much as what you mentioned with, uh, with politics there. I think in the way that I have really seen them behave in terms of my research is that they, they seem to be really willing to be able to go out there and put out a price or odds or you know, whatever it is on a particular game that really represents kind of the, the true odds of the game. There's not a whole lot of bias that's being put into that, even though the betters themselves are immensely biased. So you'll see that the betting action is really swaying in one direction, but they're unwilling to be able to, to move the odds in that direction. So um, I think in that particular thing, if they are very good at being able to recognize what is the proper price to put out there, and they're willing to go ahead and be able to stay at that, even though they're, you know, they're willing to accept the imbalance that's out there. It, it does go ahead and put them at some risk, but it also goes ahead and gets to be very different than you can imagine a market where they're moving fully based upon money flow, where somebody comes heavily on the one side and then comes back on the other. If they have enough money to be able to do that. I think they call that steam plays or something like that, um, and different gambling things that are out there. Um, and you know, those type of things are, are possible. Possible, but, but yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if it's in everybody's long run interest to be able to try to do something like that, right? If you obviously, yeah, you know, if you're doing something like that, you probably think you can get away with it. So that might not enter into this. But there also gets to be the case where that I think they, you know, a lot of uh, at least on the gambling side, in terms of the sports book, they do care about the long run. They prefer people not to necessarily lose all their money at once because they might not come back. But if they lose money, you know, steadily and slowly over time, they might have them for life, and you might wind up being able to. Uh, make more money off of that. And again, if you just view it as a consumption activity and not addiction, then it might not be necessarily a bad thing either. They're spending money on that as opposed to other forms of entertainment. So I think it's possible, but I don't think I have enough insight to be able to say if I think it's at all likely. There's a funny case study that sort of gives you hope in the gambling industry. And it happened over in England, the English Premier League, the soccer Leicester City, which were a terrible team before, managed to win. And it was 5,000 to 1 odds at the start of the season. And people bet because it was like a local, you know, it was their local team. And they thought, oh yeah, what's 10 pounds? I'm just yep. trying to Google quickly, but it says like 11.4 million lost to thanks to 5,001 Leicester, uh, Leicester's win. Bookies vow never again as 5,001 <laughs> Leicester closed on the title. Uh, the, hey, what's this one? The odds quoted are, are the same as Elvis being alive. Like, <laughs> uh, I think they learned a few lessons in that one. I don't think they'll be the doing yes. <laughs> an amazing story definitely an amazing story for the ages people will be talking about that for a long long time yeah that's gonna be a good 30 for 30 i can't wait yeah <laughs> definitely definitely now let's talk i've got a few little sports fan questions to wrap up um these are kind of fun sure. um anyway so we've got uh three questionable teams that i like to analyze and try and break down and try and figure out what they're doing because well it doesn't seem to be working quite frankly there's three different approaches to the swing and the miss scenario so we're going to sort of go down in order from probably the most spectacular breakdowns to the least spectacular. You might have looked at these teams. We're trying to figure out what's going on. And maybe it's just a talent evaluation thing. I'm not too sure. But number one, NFL, Philadelphia Eagles, Chip Kelly last year. He blew up the team. Um, 
to rebuild it. It kind of didn't work. In fact, it didn't work at all. What do you think Chip Kelly might have been thinking in that scenario? Well, I mean, part of it is that when you have so much success, you know, going back, you believe you're going to continue to have success. And I think that what happens in, in that type of building of a team is similar to what happens with, uh, you know, players losing all their money, right? It's a matter of that. We hear with this, you know, big, big issue here that talks about a lot in the, in the States and a variety of different media things that, well, how can players that make so much money lose, you know, all that money? And a lot of it is because they're, they're confident, right? That basically you have to be confident to be able to succeed in sports. And, you know, people often talk talk about cockiness and they don't like the attitudes and things like that. But there's so many great players out there that if you lose confidence, I'm guessing you're not going to be able to stay in the league very long. And the same thing happens with coaches. I mean, you have success, you're confident in your your scheme and you're, you know, you're willing to go ahead and bet on yourself, you know, not literally putting the, uh, the money out there, but being able to go ahead and say, I think my plan is better than what anybody else's plan was. So they fight for more and more control of the team and then try to be able to put all the cards on the table and be able to figure out if that works. And I think that um, maybe, you know, overestimated a bit in terms of Bradford's ability and what that would be able to do and that his system would be able to go ahead and work, you know, as well, if not better in the NFL as it did in college. And those were probably both misconceptions on his part, but it doesn't mean that it couldn't work somewhere else or with a different, you know, batch of players. We have, um, you know, Belichick as an example of that it's going to go down as one of the greatest coaches of all time. But if you told anybody that when he was with the Browns, they probably would have laughed at you. So it's, uh, it's, it, it can go ahead and be something that, you know, sometimes you just get a lot of, uh, of bad luck in terms of sports in the short run, too. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, your your plan's not going to work. Now, personally, do I think that the system's going to translate great into the NFL and be able to be everything it was at Oregon? I don't think so. I think the players are so fast, and there's there's so much that they learn from week to week by watching film and breaking everything down that it, you really still need the talent, and you're going to have a few wheat wrinkles that help you. Uh, but it's a matter of that. Um, I think it It'll be interesting again to be able to see if uh, if it can happen. Speaking of Belichick, I'd love we've got to try and figure out a way to get him to play Popovic at, at something like Connect Four or something <laughs> like that. They do so well with just yeah. you know ordinary players from year to year. The, there's, right. there's got to be some sort of genius there, but yeah, that'd be a good Connect Amazing, Four game yeah. to watch. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, yes. <laughs> uh, number two, Philadelphia 76ers, Sam Hinkie. He talks a lot about the process. In fact, I think that could almost have a TM on the end of it. It seems to just be lose it. His process is just to lose as much as possible. What's going on there? They've got like three or four number ones now. They're looking at, they got the number one this year. Right, yeah. Is there still kind of whiffing? Is that a talent evaluation thing this time or what's the process? Do you I- yeah, I believe so. I think that part of that is that, and part of it also gets to be is that if you, you know, if you tank enough, eventually you should get enough top picks. That even if your talent evaluation is not that great, if you go with what all the other experts are saying, you're you're probably going to stumble upon the good players. They're going to go ahead and be able to help you win. So um, it's it's something that they might now have gotten to be bad enough that they're going to amass the talent as long as they stay with it and be able to be you know willing to um, you know put the money in and. and uh, rebuild around those players that they might be okay. And, and Philadelphia is a tough market, but it's also a, a market that people will come back when you start to do well. So they, they really do like to see their fans do well. I grew up outside of, of Philadelphia. So it's a matter of that. You, they can be very, very harsh and very uh, mean and uh, and say they're never going to go ahead and watch again. But as soon as the team shows a little bit of hope, they uh, they come back in droves. So um, so I think that if you know it, the market itself lends it, then that they can go ahead and be able to have the time to do this. I think the bigger problem gets to be is that when you whiff and then you're in a marketplace where it's really not going to be worth it to you to be able to try to be successful and then they just kind of ride that out and be able to make you know kind of just you know maybe spend less on talent and just try to make some money off the business as opposed to being able to uh, build up a talent roster to try to be you know super successful but I would guess from the Sixers side it's just they've missed on them on some of the picks and they haven't really brought together the group of players to be able to be an underachieving bunch that can go ahead and be able to uh, to put out a pretty good record or make a you know push for a playoff a position or anything like that, like some other markets have, right? They've whiffed on the top talent, but they still put together enough secondary talent that they're competitive. Uh, Philly's just gotten so bad at that that you know. But with basketball, meaning that in a lot of cases you don't even need you know the five players on the court to be and terrific. You just need a few of them, and then you need role players around. And uh, I think basketball you can rebuild pretty quickly. Okay, number three, Cleveland Browns. Now this is a bit of low hanging fruit when we're talking about down and out, but their quarterback scenario. There's a guy with a jersey and it has like 15 names you keep scratching them out and then put adding a bit of sticky tape to the bottom with a new name on it um <laughs> uh, what's the sort of what could be going on with those guys is that again um 
Yeah, I don't really understand. Yeah, no, I, I think, again, that's kind of just missing on, on player talent. I, as a matter of, if I think back to Cleveland, I don't know if they've had too much bad luck in terms of the picks, in terms of injuries or anything like that, which is always a possibility for a sport like the NFL, that you, you draft high and then somebody goes ahead and gets hurt and is never the same. That really hurts you. You know, when you're at the down point of your cycle and you're trying to rebuild, it's tough to get out from that point. But as best as I can tell, it seems that they've missed, right? They've just gone out after players that really have not gone ahead and turned into superstars or even stars in some cases they've been cast off and so it's difficult to come at that and as you mentioned the, the quarterback is so important in the NFL that if you have good quarterback play you can go ahead and be successful and they, they just haven't had good quarterback play and the little bit of stretches that they were being competitive is when the quarterbacks played well so it's a it's a league that is really really quarterback dependent there's there's exceptions when you have a great defense and the quarterback can just be a game manager I think that those type of things do occur and we tend to go ahead and focus on that and say yes that's a possibility particularly when you're a fan of a team that doesn't have a great quarterback but it's a matter of that if we really look at the success of the league it, it's driven by the star quarterbacks and, and you need to find that and in a lot of ways you can't blame Cleveland for taking shots, right? That they want to go ahead and get a star quarterback. It just did not go ahead and work out. And, um, you know, so, so for every star quarterback that you draft, there's a whole bunch of players out there that uh, were drafted by other teams that just did not pan out. So some of it's just uh, luck. Some of it just gets to be is that they probably did not do as good a job at talent evaluation as other teams have. Because it was really weird. They tried to draw that you generally you can build a team through the draft or through free agency or just kind of get lucky with like a hometown hero. But they try, kind of tried all of them and none of them really worked out. So I really feel for Cleveland in that respect. Yeah, no. sometimes it's just bad luck, right? Sometimes it's just uh, in terms of those things, you think you have it right. And um, that's one thing I've always been interested in, like with the uh, data side, is that I think we can now start to compare, like, what is the consensus pick or what is the consensus best free agent versus what the team does. And I think that's going to give us a lot better insight into how good general managers are, right? Because if you're a good general manager, quote unquote, because you drafted who everybody else you know, was going to draft, well, then you're really not that great. You're pretty much the same. You've just been blessed that you've been put in a situation that you're able to get a superstar and be able to build around it. On the other hand, if you went off the boards and basically started to choose players that other teams would not have and you had success, those are the people that are really the prizes. And uh, that's something I hope to look into in the in the near future. I was absolutely going to say, I think uh, I think that must be our mission is to try and use data to disprove luck <laughs> if we can avoid. Yep, yep exactly. Yep. <laughs> now, okay, this is the last question. This is a fun one. So I know I did a bit of digging. I realized I know that you're based at Syracuse now. Since you joined Syracuse in 2011, the men's basketball team have reached the final four twice out of a possible four, with the other one being the elite eight, and then there was sort of an outlier with the third round. Is this a coincidence? <laughs> yeah, perfectly right. It's a matter of that. There's a, no relationship there whatsoever. I'm sure I can prove that <laughs> in some ways, statistically, to be able to show. But no, that's uh, we we have, we have nothing to do in terms of with the uh, with the basketball program and what they do. Beheim's, uh, what his recruiting skills and being able to put out there a you know, defense that confuses people, even though it's been out there for the longest time, it is all on them. And uh, it has nothing to do with me, or unfortunately, we, we'd love to be able to say that, yes, we've had some, uh, some insight into that, but that's, uh, that's not us. That's all the players, and that's all the, the coaching staff over there that does that. But, uh, but yes, if I, if I have a chance to use that somewhat, maybe, <laughs> maybe I will. But, uh, but yes, no, there's, there's definitely no uh, correlation there whatsoever in, in terms of a uh, Awesome, you know? so. <laughs> I don't think they'd be breaching any like NCAA regulation because they they wouldn't have been written yet. They're like hundred year old regulations. <laughs> They're more concerned That's about true. you not bringing your horse and cart to the game or something like that. But. <laughs> That's true. Okay. Well, uh, anyway, I'll probably put some bets on Syracuse, something or other, because I'm sure that's like that's a <laughs> massive oversight. They haven't tapped into your resource, and and they're going to have so many graduates coming through with the new program. Yeah, we're, we're excited. We're hopeful that we'll be able to go ahead and get more of um, more of that re- relationship going with the, with athletics. It's, it seems like it would be a natural course, and now we're going to have a lot of students that might have things to add that they didn't necessarily have before. I mean, we have a lot of people that you know help work with the teams and, and do things in support roles, but now we might actually have some people that are able to help crunch numbers in recruiting or in terms of game preparation and things like that. And, uh, and we're hopeful 
successful. We're going through another athletic director change, unfortunately, so we have to see how that comes about. But but I have heard from some coaches on um, on campus on different sports that, with the announcement of the program, that would like to be able to tap in and uh, and start to work with us. And I'm very excited about that. Yeah, well, if if he doesn't, I think Mike Shashevsky's um ears picked up over at Duke. There, he's looking for an edge. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> hey, listen, thank you very much for for chatting with us. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Not a problem. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it greatly. You can find more of Rodney's work on his ResearchGate page at researchgate.net forward slash profile forward slash Rodney underscore Paul. And perhaps this talk has inspired you to become the next Billy Bean or Pat Riley, in which case you should definitely enroll in the new Syracuse course. Don't hesitate to get in contact with us with your questions via the contact us page at univ.com.au or on our Facebook page where you can revisit this and many other episodes of the Univ podcast. That's all for now and stay tuned for the next episode of the Univ podcast. I'm your host, Simon Holland. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you for listening to the Univ podcast. To follow our series, please subscribe to our channel via iTunes, Beyond Pod, or the equivalent service. And if you particularly enjoyed the show, please don't forget to rate. For further information, news, videos, and articles, head to univ.com.au. 